Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 18 through 24. Amos chapter 5, verses 18 through 24. If you struggle to know where Amos is, because we don't turn there very often, um, it's the third of the minor prophets. So if you can find Ezekiel and Daniel, go over a couple, three books, and you'll find Amos. So you'll have Ezekiel, Daniel, uh, Hosea, Joel, and Amos. And so uh, turn there, and I want to speak to you today on a sermon that I titled, Let Justice Roll. Let justice roll. Obviously, this is a continuation of our sermon series through the uh, Minor Prophets. This is number three in our series. Now, there are a lot of things going on here in the life of Amos and the time of Amos and then the Northern Kingdom. So there's a lot of things going on, a lot of different moving parts, which makes this book very interesting. And out of all the other minor prophets that, that I've looked at so far in my preparation uh, for this sermon series, this one seems to be the most relevant to our nation today, uh, and even to the church. So this seems to be the most relevant, culturally speaking, to our nation. Uh, now the way this is going to work this morning, and I'm glad I got plenty of time, but this may take a little while. The way this is going to work this morning is I will read our text. And then I'll give you the context in which Amos is writing, and then we'll make a few um, applications. So uh, uh, let's buckle up, and let's get started. Amos chapter 5, 18 through 24. If you have it, say amen. amen. All right, let's read the Word of God. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met it, or as though he went into the house, leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent did it. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? Is it not very dark with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feast days, and I do not savor your sacred assemblies. Though you uh, offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, nor will I regard your fat and peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your string instruments. But let justice roll down, run down like water, and righteousness like a mighty stream. Did you offer me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness for years, O house of Israel? You also carried Sukkot, your king, and Kuan, your idols, the star, your god, which you made for yourselves. Therefore, I will send you into captivity beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to read, to study, proclaim your word. And so now at this time, God, I ask that you would open our hearts. God, if you would open our minds, God, that we might receive that which you put before us this day. God, that we might apply it to our lives. God, that we might realize, Lord, that you are indeed a just God. But God, you are also a merciful God. And God, I pray that we'll respond to the work of the Holy Spirit within our hearts. Lord, may you pour out your Spirit upon this place and upon these people. And God, may you be exalted through it all. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's start by learning a little bit about this man, Amos. Amos was a simple kind of man. Uh, he was a shepherd uh, or, or a sheep breeder, I guess you would say. Uh, and he was a farmer of sycamore fig trees, which I didn't even know existed. But uh, whatever the fruit of a sycamore tree is, that's what he farmed. And so uh, Amos lived in the southern kingdom of Judah. And God called him to go prophesy to the northern kingdom of Israel. And he told him to prophesy about their coming judgment or their coming destruction. Okay, So Amos was not respected as a prophet. All right? He was not respected as a prophet because, number one, um, he wasn't even from the northern kingdom. 
Okay? He wasn't even from another kingdom. Could you imagine? Just, just imagine for just a moment if somebody who's not even from America was to come to America and say, hey, look, God's going to judge your nation. And we're looking at them like, you're not even an American. Who are you to come in here and tell us that, right? Well, that's kind of the way it was with Amos. Amos was from Judah, went to Israel, went to the northern kingdom and said, hey, look, uh, God's about to destroy you. God's about to judge you. So he wasn't respected because, number one, he wasn't from the northern kingdom. Number two, um, he didn't come from a family of prophets. So he wasn't a son of a prophet, which was pretty common in the Old Testament. And then, of course, number three, um, he was not very well respected because he was not an educated prophet. You see, prophets in the Old Testament were typically educated. They had schools for prophecy. But Amos did not attend one. Amos was a simple man. He was a, he was a farmer and a sheep breeder. That's what he did, right? But yet God called him to go prophesy to the northern kingdom. With that, Amos was not, uh, he didn't have much credibility, right? Especially in the northern kingdom. Now, we actually see this in, in Amos 7. So hold your place there in Amos 5. Turn over a couple of pages to Amos chapter 7. We're going to look at verses 10 through 17 as we see the character uh, of Amos here. This is who Amos is. Um, and as he responds to what they think about him. So uh, verse 10 of chapter 7. Then Amaziah, the priest, of Bethel. Now Bethel, of course, is one of the worship temples in the north. In the midst of the house of Israel, the land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword. And Israel shall surely be led away captive from their own land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer, flee to the land of Judah, there eat bread, and there prophesy. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is the royal residence. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet, but I was a sheep breeder and tender of sycamore fruit. Then the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Now therefore, hear the word of the Lord. You say, Do not prophesy again against Israel, and do not uh, spout against the house of, Israel, of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Your wife shall be a harlot in the city. Your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword. Your land shall be divided by a survey line. By a survey line. You shall die in a uh, divided land, and Israel shall surely be led away captive from his own land. And so the message, um, uh, what we see here is that, is that Amos really didn't have much credibility. They didn't really, they didn't really care to hear what Amos had to say. Now the message from God through Amos um, with him proclaiming judgment was him proclaiming judgment on Israel or started off with him proclaiming judgment on the surrounding nations of Israel. And so when you start in chapter 1, you'll see uh, Amos speaking judgment against a nation where it says, uh, the Lord has four sins against you, even three against you. And so he calls out these sins amongst the nations that are surrounding Israel. So in the beginning, Amos' prophecy doesn't really sound all that bad from Israel's perspective. I mean, could you imagine hearing this as a nation? A prophet has come and said that the day of the Lord has come and he's going to destroy all the nations around you, all the nations that are surrounding you. Now, keep this in mind. Now, as we go through the Old Testament, you need to keep this thought in mind. Um, when Israel fought the day of the Lord, they thought it was God coming down to destroy their enemies and make them the greatest of all nations. And so when they would hear about the day of the Lord, they would automatically think, okay, God is sending down or, or, or coming down to destroy our enemies and make us the nation that you promised Abraham that we would be. And so that's what Amos did. He came and he said, look, God's going to judge the seven uh, nations that surround you. Right? And that's what he says. This, this sounds like pretty good news. Now remember, keep in mind, they, the way they think about the day of the Lord. So they know that God is coming at some point to destroy his enemies. 
They know that God's coming at some point to destroy his enemies. The sad thing about it, though, is they don't see themselves as enemies of God. The children of Israel, the northern kingdom, does not see themselves as enemies of God. We, too, have a hard time seeing ourselves as enemies of God. But the Bible says that we are, or at least at some point in time, were enemies of God. So we, we, we're, we're easy to see that everybody else are enemies of God, but we struggle to see how we are enemies of God. And that's kind of the way Israel is. They're, they're like, yes, God's going to come to destroy our nation or the nations around us uh, because of the day of the Lord. So he, once he proclaims this judgment amongst the seven nations that surround Israel, he then announces judgment upon Israel. Okay? So he says, look, the seven nations around you are going to be judged. Everybody applauds, say, that's great. And then he says, but you too will be judged. And he begins into the judgment of the Israel, which is far greater than the other seven uh, judgments that were proclaimed. As a matter of fact, chapter 5 uh, has actually been called a eulogy for Israel. A eulogy. It's like the it's like their funeral, right? Chapter 5 is like the funeral message uh, for Israel. So Amos's prophecy is very dark. We see that in our uh, passage that we just read a moment ago. He talks a lot about destruction. He talks a lot about exile. And what we see, or what we don't see, is a whole lot of hope. We don't see a whole lot of hope in the book of Amos. If you take time and you read it, it's a lot of poetry-type writing. But what you don't see is very much hope in this prophecy. As a matter of fact, you don't get any glimmer of hope uh, until you get to the last five verses of Amos. That's about the only hope that you'll find in the book where it talks about David's fallen shelter being restored. Of course, we know that that's talking about Jesus, right? And so there's not a whole lot of hope. This is a dark message, all right? So just keep that in mind. Now let's talk about, let's talk about uh, the northern kingdom. Let's talk about Israel now. The kingdom, uh, this is the kingdom which Amos is prophesying to. Now at the time of Amos' prophecy, Israel was very prosperous. Okay? Israel was very prosperous. I want you to think about Israel at this time. And I want you to think about America as a nation. So um, Israel is very uh, prosperous, almost as prosperous as they were when Solomon was king. And so we know that Solomon was uh, the wisest man, but he's also one of the richest men to ever live. And so the northern kingdom had got about as prosperous as they were when Solomon was king. Not only was Israel prosperous and rich, but under the leadership of Jeroboam II, Israel had become a military powerhouse. And so they were a military powerhouse. They were a nation who was proud of who they were and where they came from. Nationalism was at an all-time high in the northern kingdom. Israel was a very religious nation as well. So nationalism was an all-time high. Israel was a very religious nation. And since Jerusalem uh, was in the southern kingdom, uh, and Israel wasn't a part of the southern kingdom, they kind of built their own temples. They built two temples. And uh, in those temples, they put golden calves. How ironic is that when you go back and you read the book of Exodus? But that's exactly what they did. So they built their own temples, um, put these golden calves um, put the golden calves in there, and so uh, they would go and they would worship. On one hand, uh, they were going through the motions of worshiping God, while on the other hand, they were worshiping other things as well. And so Israel was a very religious nation. On the outside, it would look like Israel was an inclusive spiritual nation. They were an inclusive spiritual nation. They invited all religions, all beliefs, come. As a matter of fact, if you've got the NIV Bible and you read the, the commentary that's before um, the book of Amos, it actually says that um, Amos, or, or the northern kingdom, uh, their motto was, God is with us. That was their motto. All right, so when we look at this and we see this, this sounds very familiar to our nation right now, right? Think about it. I mean, we're very prosperous, right? We're a military powerhouse. 
nationalism, religion. I mean, this sounds a lot like America. I mean, our money says in God we trust. America, again, is a military power. America has the number one economy in the world. And as far as nationalism goes, people are, 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 are prouder to be an American than they are a Christian. When it comes to spirituality, America has no lack of spirituality. It, it's just most of it has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit or following Jesus, right? It's get in touch with your inner self. It's, it's this new age, Scientology, believe in yourself mentality. There's no lack of spirituality in America. There's a lack of the Holy Spirit in people in America, but there's no lack of spirituality in America. America looks like the northern kingdom of Israel, if you ask me. And we read from Amos what God says to them. And this is what I believe it is. It's probably the most relevant um, minor prophet to any that we see. And then actually, you'll see even more as we go how much, um, how, how relevant this is. So what can we learn from the book of Amos? What is the problem that God calls out in the nation of Israel? So what's the, what's the big deal? What's the big problem here? And what we see over and over again in the book of Amos and right here in chapter 5 is God calling them out for their lack of righteousness and justice. Their lack of righteousness and justice. So let's just take a look at this very, very quickly, just in chapter 5. I'm not going to have you turn everywhere, but I want to show you in chapter 5, start with verse 7. It says, You who turn justice to wormwood, wormwood and lay righteousness to rest in the earth. And so he's calling out their lack of justice and, and righteousness. Verse 12. For I know you, your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins, afflicting the just and taking bribes, diverting the poor from justice at the gate. Now, of course, you have to remember the gate in most of these nations and to these cities is where they conducted court, right? This is where people were judged. If you had a matter, you took it to the gate, and then they would, uh, they would then decide. And so what he is saying is that justice wasn't being performed at the gate, okay? Now look at verse 15. It says, hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Verse 24 in our text. But let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. And then if you turn over to chapter 6 and verse 12, you'll see it again. It says, Do horses run on rocks? Does one plow there with oxen? Yet you have turned justice into gall and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. And so he's calling them out for their lack of justice and righteousness. You see, the rich were taking advantage of the poor. The judges were taking bribes. The leaders of the nation were being influenced by money and not doing what is right. Justice was not being done in the nation of Israel. Now that word justice, that's an interesting word. I don't know if you've ever taken the time to think about that word justice. When we talk about God being a just God, but what does that even mean? Right? What does that even look like? But that word justice is a very interesting word. As a matter of fact, uh, justice was the 2018 Miriam Webster Word of the Year. That word justice. I mean, if this doesn't just, just spew relevancy. Uh, I don't know what does. Because justice is constantly being talked about in our nation. Justice is one of those words that is constantly being thrown around in our nation and in our culture. Almost every time you turn on the TV or you watch the news, you hear something about economic justice or social justice or political justice or criminal justice. We, we hear all the time this word, justice. And justice it, it is a very hot topic in our nation today. But the sad thing about it, the sad thing about justice is that everybody has a different idea of what it is. Everybody has a different idea of what justice 
is. I was blown away when I began to research justice and, and what is justice and all this kind of stuff. I mean, I was blown away at the many different thoughts concerning justice. And so what that means is that justice is a philosophical idea, but it is also a biblical idea. Of course, it gets its roots from the Word. So it's a philosophical idea, but it's also a biblical idea. I want to look at the biblical idea in just a moment. Before we do, let, let's briefly talk about justice. Let's, let's just think about justice for just a moment and see just how divisive justice would really be. Okay? Let's just think about it. Okay? Um, when someone thinks about justice, when you think about justice, um, most people think about equality or, or fairness. Right? I mean, when we think about justice, we think about a judge and a jury that's impartial, that's fair, that's going to you know, do what's right. Okay? So that's kind of what we think. We think about the words um, fairness and equality. Now, Take economic justice. I'm not going to go through all the different types of justice. Let's talk about, uh, let's take economic justice, for example. Economic justice. See, our nation, as I said a moment ago, has the number one economy in the world. The number one economy in the world. And so uh, we have all of these resources available, you know, mainly like, like money, okay? Uh, so we have all of these resources available, and, and they are to be distributed amongst the people. Okay? Now, the question is, what is a fair way or a just way to distribute these resources? What is a just way, what is a fair way to distribute the resources? And that's what economic justice is all about. Now, one thought is that everybody would have equal part to the resources. Everybody would have equal part to the resources. Everyone would make the same wage no matter what they did. To some, that seems fair. But what about the person who works as a doctor and goes to school for 12 years? Should he or she uh, make the same as a person? And let's just use my field so to not uh, uh, offend anybody. Should, should that surgeon, should that doctor who's that educated and that skilled uh, make the same ways that a pastor makes? I'm just going to use my, you fill in your blank, right? I mean, should, should a pastor and a, and a heart surgeon uh, make the same wages? I mean, this is economic justice debate, right? Should the one uh, who, who works the hardest or has, uh, or has the most difficult job be rewarded with the most resources? Should the one who works the hardest or has the most difficult job be rewarded the most resources? I mean, well, think about it like this. And so this is... This is the argument, right? What about the person who was born with a disability? Or the person who had absent parents? Or a person who has learning issues or, or mental issues? Many of them have to work hard just to make it through the day, right? So we can't be so naive to think that everybody starts on the same level playing field, right? Not everybody starts on the same level. A child uh, with a stable home life, with all their basic needs met, will have a far better chance to gain the available resources. A child with a broken home, uh, or grew up in a broken home life, and basic needs not always being met, is going to have a more difficult time gaining the available resources. So is it fair, or is it just, that one must work ten times harder than the other just to overcome the hand that was dealt to them. I mean, I have three children, right? And they, none of them learned the same. I mean, one, it was natural. Didn't have to study. Didn't even have to crack open the book. And they just passed everything. Could have done far better if they would have studied. And then one who would have to study and study and pour and pour just to make a C. And if they really did well, they'd make a B. 
Same one wants to say that, but yet one worked 20 times harder than the other, but yet didn't make the great even steel. And so to think that everybody starts out on a level playing field it is, is naive to think. And so is it fair or is it just that one must work 10 times harder than the other just to overcome the hand that is dealt to him? Now, I know what everybody's thinking. And I said this to my kids, and you've probably heard this in your, life, in your entire life. Life isn't fair. Life isn't fair. And here's the thing, church. As long as, life, as, long as sin exists, life will never be fair. As long as sin exists, life will never be fair. But that doesn't mean we should take advantage of the unfairness of others. That's where the sin in our life comes. We cannot take advantage of the unfairness of others, which is what the Israelites were doing when Amos calls them out. And it's what big business does in America as well, such as big pharma insurance. They are capitalizing on people's unfairness in life, capitalizing on people's misfortunes in life, capitalizing on the hands that they were dealt in life and becoming billionaires and millionaires. And so they're capitalizing on one's uh, unfairness in life. Even individuals capitalize on the unfairness of life. There are still people recovering from last year's storm and now we have this other one breathing down our neck and there are builders and roofers and other construction workers taking money but not doing the job. Taking advantage of the unfairness of someone else's life. And it's wrong and it's sin for us to take advantage of someone else's unfairness in life. Now what does that have to do with us? Because I'm sure that nobody here does that. I'm sure that nobody here does that and that's good. But we can't turn a blind eye to it either, church. We can't turn a blind eye either. And we certainly shouldn't contribute to it, and even, even if it's indirect. And this was the problem with Israel. Those who could do something wouldn't do something. I'm going to explain what I mean before, before, I, um, before I explain what I just said a second ago. I want to go a little bit deeper with this. Before I do, I want to give you the big idea from the book of Hosea, or from the book of Amos. This is what it's all about. Okay? This is the big picture. If you don't get anything else that I say this morning, this is what I want you to get. This is what I want you to write down. This is what I want you to write all over the book of Amos. And this is what this is America's biggest problem. Right here. When you worship anything less than God, you will view people less than human. Or image bearers of God. When you worship anything less than God, you will view people less than what they are. And that is image bearers of God. Every single person who has the breath of life in them are image bearers of God. And they are to be held accordingly. When you worship anything less than God, you will view people less than human or image bearers of God. The Israelites were going through the motions of worship, but they were not worshiping. They were not worshiping God. Look at verse 21 and through 23 again. Listen to what God is telling them here. He's saying, I hate, I despise your feast days. And I do not savor your sacred assembly. In other words, I'm tired of your churchiness. That's what he's saying. He said, just go through the motion. Let's keep reading. Verse 21 or verse 22. Uh, Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, nor will I regard your fat and peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your songs. For I will not hear the melody of your string instruments. The Israelites were going through the motions of worship. They had a the bumper sticker, right? They attended the church. They did all the right things. They raised their hand in worship. They played the right instrument. They sang the right songs. They did everything right on the outside, but they were deceived and, and, and uh, messed up on the inside. Their heart was not right. 
You see, because they didn't really worship God. They worship money. They worship power. They worship pleasure. They worship notoriety. Just to name a couple of things that they worship. They were not worshiping God. And because they were not worshiping God, they viewed people less than what they were. They viewed people less than who they were. They viewed people uh, as a way to get rich. They view people as a way to have power. They view, they view people uh, as a way to make their name known. And we see people doing that today, right? I mean, politicians are really, really good at this. I mean, they don't, they don't see people as people. They see people as votes, as money, as, as things like that. They don't really see people as what they are. But it doesn't just happen in the political realm, church. It doesn't just happen in the political realm. Let me just pull, pull this one out there. Think about pornography just for a moment. Think about pornography. When, when you view pornography, you are worshiping pleasure. You are worshiping yourself. And when you look at those women, and when you look at those men, you do not see them as human. You see them as an object, which leads you to see others as objects and not humans. This is why it destroys marriages. Pornography is one of those industries that takes advantage of the unfairness in people's life. Do you realize, I don't even know if you realize this or not. I may have said it uh, uh, once before, but do you realize that when you look at pornography, you are indirectly or maybe even directly contributing to human trafficking, which is one of the most, one of the greatest atrocities of today's time? Human trafficking is, is, real and it's, it's heartbreaking and it definitely does not please God and whenever you view pornography you are contributing to that maybe indirectly but also maybe directly see the Bible's not quiet about righteousness and justice or justice and righteousness see we cannot as believers take advantage of the unfairness of others life but we also can't sit back and do nothing about it we can't sit back and not do anything about it. We, we need to do something. We're called to do something as the church. The Bible gives us a list of people uh, which life has been unfair to. And the Bible has called us to be good to them. The orphan. The poor. The stranger. The widow. The Bible has called us to be good to these people. We even see Jesus reaching out to the lame and the disabled. And of course, the list can go on and on when we talk about Jesus and life that he did. He, he, he reached out to those that life has been unfair to. Micah chapter 6, verse 8 says, Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with the Lord. Some translations say, Seek justice, love mercy. Walk humbly with the Lord. And we'll talk probably more about that when we get to the book of Micah. But I go back to our text in verse 24. Where Amos writes, But let justice run down like water, and righteousness like a mighty stream. Now obviously, God will make right every wrong. There's coming a day where God will make right every wrong. And too many people sitting on church pews are just sitting back waiting for that to happen. They're just sitting back waiting for that to happen. Well, God will make it right. No, God will make it right. One day God's going to come. And he, I'm, I'm just going to wait and let God do that. That's not what we're called to do from the Bible. That's not what we're called to do biblically. Obviously, God will make right every wrong that's ever been done, but we as believers also must let justice and righteousness roll in, in from our lives. But what does that look like? What does that look like? How do, how do we let justice and righteousness run through our life or roll from our life? Well, here's the thing. When we let justice and righteousness roll, we are essentially doing what is right Fueled by mercy. We're doing what is right, fueled 
by mercy. It's not going to be on the screen. I kind of added this uh, late. But I want you to remember this. When we let justice and righteousness roll, we are essentially doing what is right, fueled by mercy. And so as we begin to close, I want you to turn over to Romans chapter 12. Keep your place here in Amos 5. But turn over to Romans chapter 12. I want to read verses 9 through the end of the chapter. I, I think this is, explains far better what it looks like to let justice and righteousness run in our life. Um, Romans chapter 12 starting with verse 9 going all the way to the end of the chapter this is, this is what it looks like to let justice roll let justice and righteousness roll that's what it says it said, let love be without hypocrisy abhor what is evil and I could explain each one of these I mean obviously don't say you love somebody but not act like you love them so let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. That's the problem in the world today. We don't hate evil. We don't hate evil. We enjoy evil. Right? Let's keep reading. Hopefully we'll get through it. <coughs> Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another. In other words, thinking about the other before we think about ourselves. Verse 11. Not lagging in diligence. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind for one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repeat, repay no evil, no one evil for evil. Have regard for the good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heat the coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We let justice and righteous roll to make known the kingdom of God that will come. So why, why do we do this? And why do we do what it says in Romans chapter 12? Our purpose of doing kind, being kind, being loving, being merciful, and all that, the purpose is to introduce them to Jesus. When you stop and you think about all the people that Jesus helped in the New Testament, the purpose was to introduce them to his kingdom. And so we are to seek justice. We can't sit back and wait for God to do it because then justice or, or people wouldn't know about the kingdom of God. People wouldn't hear about Jesus. And so when we see the weak and the afflicted and the unfairness of people's life, we step into their life with grace and mercy. We show love and show kindness and we introduce them to the kingdom of God. Or we share with them the kingdom of God. So when it comes to justice, God's justice, um, or when it comes to, to, to doing justice, it is with the purpose of making known the kingdom of God. And the thing about the kingdom of God, it's a place where life will be fair. Justice will rule, and Jesus will reign. Well, here's what, I, I think it's ironic. I think it's ironic, and I think that this happens in the church. How we always want to see justice come to pass. Until we find ourselves in the universe. We always want to see justice poured out to its fullest extent until we are the ones who stand in need of mercy. You see, God was calling Amos, or using Amos to call the children of Israel. He was using that as mercy. Amos was God's mercy to the northern kingdom. When it comes to God's justice, you'll find mercy in the person of Jesus Christ. His justice and his mercy are never separate. 
You know, a lot of times we think, well, if we give somebody mercy, we're not really giving them justice. But that's not the way it works. You, you, you don't see the justice of God separated from his mercy. It's always the same. Think about the cross. The greatest example of this is at the cross. What do we see at the cross? We see the justice of God being poured out upon Jesus, our sins. But at the same time, we see God's mercy being poured out upon us. And so you never see the separation between mercy and justice. We see this in Jesus on the cross. God's justice being carried out and at the same time, his mercy be poured out. But here's the thing. There is a judgment day coming. Amos, and, and there is no escaping it. And Amos says in verse 19 that those who have ignored God's mercy, those who have ignored God's mercy, it says, it is as though a man fled from a lion and a bear man. Or went into his house, leaned on the wall, and a serpent did it. What Amos is saying is like you can run, but you can't escape the judgment of God. You can run, but you can't escape the judgment of God. You can either accept his mercy at the cross, or you can accept his judgment the eternal separation from him. There is no escape in God's judgment. The only way you'll ever enter the perfect kingdom of God is by putting your faith in Jesus Christ and living in your life. May we be a church. And we give people with justice and righteousness the Lord like a river and the mighty strength of God. Let's pray for the conditions come. Father, we thank you again for your word. God, we thank you that it speaks to us directly. Lord, as a nation, God, it speaks directly to us. God, I feel like so oftentimes we, we sit back and God, we just wait for you to make things right. It, it, it's clear in your word that, that that's not the position that we are to take. God, we are, we are to seek mercy. We are, we are to seek justice too. We, we are to see that that those in which life is being unfair to, we, we are there for them. To share the kingdom of God. Right? To share the love of Jesus. To, to help them however we can help them. God, so oftentimes the church just sit back and they let the government do that work and, and, and we yeah. God I pray Lord that you just help us to be better at that. God help us to, uh, to to let justice and righteousness roll on our lives. Like a river and like a mighty stream. God I pray to do as there's connotation for me to us because he's a stand in every down and God will do that. How merciful have you been to those that you've seen hurt? How often do we turn away and we see someone in need? And we see someone who has been life's been unfair to it. And I know that many of you in here, if not all of you in here, would never take advantage of somebody who was down on the who's down on, on uh, just, just the unfairness of life has gotten to them. I know that many of you, if not all of you, would not take advantage of a person like that. But that's not the question. That's not the call that you have. Your call is that when you see those people, when you see those people that life has been unfair to, are you extending your hand? Are you helping them however you can? Sometimes that's just a simple prayer. It's a little <clears throat> but the purpose in doing all of that is to introduce that person to the kingdom of God. Introduce that person to Jesus Christ. And, and, and according to Amos, woe to a nation who takes advantage of those whose life, of those who have been dealt with an unfair hand.